invite to the stage um, Dr. Jennifer Edwards, who's a senior fellow at Westat Insight. And I want to invite to the stage Dr. Tia Fletcher, who is a researcher at Westat Insight. So I'm going to give it to the two of you to take it away. Oh, oh, quicker. I'll need that. <laughs> Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks so much in advance for your kindness as we work through this uh, considerable amount of research, considerable amount of findings we have to talk to you about today. So, so as Doc said, I'm Jennifer Edwards, and with me is Tia Fletcher. Um, online, though probably not able to participate, is Albert Liu, who is our Director of Education at what was formerly called Insight Policy Research. We had a big change this summer. We were acquired by Westat and have joined forces, and so that's why you see that language of Westat Insight now. All right, <laughs> so thank you all for having us. Thank you National Urban League and Unidos for giving us the opportunity to participate in this really important effort. Um, as you've heard, we're gonna be presenting to you the findings from the analysis of stakeholder interviews and focus groups that have occurred between uh, May and July of this year. Um, so as you know, so uh, National Urban League Unidos and about 15 partner organizations set out to better understand the diverse perspectives of stakeholders as they consider the future of assessments and, and try to ensure our education system meets the needs of all students. These organizations overall talk to over 260 participants from around the country. 20 one-on-one interviews were conducted and 42 focus groups of anywhere from two to 12 people um, were, were conducted. Now, in these sessions, questions with participants varied depending on the stakeholder group being interviewed and the organization conducting the interview. And this is really important. As you can imagine, the questions for students necessarily are different in focus and depth than, say, researchers and psychometricians. But in general, the topics shown here were addressed in one form or another. In particular, participants, participants were asked to reflect on how assessments, and in particular statewide or summative standardized testing, are used and what impacts they have. They were asked to reflect on their ideal use of assessments or their vision for how student knowledge and progress should be measured. And they were asked to reflect on how the education system overall is meeting student needs and where we should focus in terms of accountability efforts. What needs to be the focus? Where should that focus land? To analyze the transcripts of over 60 hours of discussions at over 1,000 pages, <laughs> our team developed a coding scheme derived from the interview protocol, so from the questions themselves. After coding and analyzing the subset of transcripts, identifying some preliminary themes, revisions are made to enable the analysis, um, the coding and analysis of all of the transcripts. So what you're gonna see presented here today are themes that emerge from this analysis. And so here a theme is defined very simply as a perspective or viewpoint that was shared by at least three different participants within a stakeholder community. If it was seen in three different stakeholder groups, we categorized it as a reoccurring theme. And that's our focus today. The final report will dive more into unique perspectives for these particular communities and also areas of emerging difference. But for the sake of time, we wanted to highlight what those reoccurring themes were. So we've organized these themes into buckets. So into the assessment bucket or the accountability bucket, problems and solutions. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of overlap there. So you might find you have a disagreement with where we placed it, no harm. <laughs> there were probably a few different ways they could have been captured and characterized. But a couple of important notes um, before we start diving in. So first is this idea of um, consensus or disagreement. And this is, I think, the most important thing, and this will not surprise anyone, but the absence of a theme in a particular stakeholder group does not mean there's disagreement. It simply means that the nature of focus groups themselves, the different focus of the questions of that facilitator, didn't give an opportunity, perhaps, or that, that, that perspective didn't emerge there. Does not mean that it's not shared. There's also considerable variation in the questions and discussions in terms of how specific they were in terms of talking about assessments or those statewide standardized tests. 
And so where possible, we've specified, but in the, where it's not clear, we've had to speak more generally in terms of assessments and draw conclusions from the context of those conversations. So just be aware that you're gonna see both language, both, both terms used. And then lastly, um, just some of this is gonna feel very familiar, right? And that's good in some ways. But other things might surprise you that perspectives and opinions continue to persist. You might be thinking, oh, there's been policy change on this issue. Why, why are people saying this? And this is where we have to caution. The, the focus here is giving voice to those who don't normally get to have an opinion and a say. It's not our job to adjudicate whether or not their experience is, is, is truthful, whether or not they had full and open information. This is what they're expressing. This is what they're concerned with. We'll start by looking at reoccurring themes focused on assessments. So participants raised and discussed a variety of concerns around the issue of the use of assessments, and most, most often focusing on those statewide standardized tests. So presented here are overarching themes that emerged and where the stakeholder communities that they emerged in. Concerns around bias in standardized testing we've seen in all groups, and we're gonna dive into this on the next slide. Next, one of the big areas of discussion really focused on the negative relationship between assessments and educational opportunity for students. Participants expressed the concern that standardized testing provides too narrow and limited a lens on student knowledge, and also that that, in turn, by not accurately reflecting student knowledge, is further exacerbated by decisions being made on access to specialized curriculum on the basis of testing results. The next theme focused on standardized testing impacts on students' mental health. Again, will probably not surprise you. This is a reoccurring theme of the role of stress, anxiety, and loss of self-esteem resonated in most groups. Some discussed the anxiety leading up to the test and others focused on the impact of testing um, on the impact of anxiety on the testing results themselves. And this is particularly interesting in the sense of giving, providing some light on the variation that still exists in school and classroom culture. So where value is placed, where teachers emphasize standardized tests, where they don't, where they try to mini minimize stress by de-emphasizing the importance of the tests versus where pressure is being placed. And then lastly, transparency and clarity around the use of standardized testing is still very mixed um, across stakeholder communities and in communities themselves. So here we see a lot of discussion around the lack of common understanding on how testing results are actually being used. And where you see this come out a lot is in terms of funding decisions, where there's a lot of confusion around exactly how those test results are being used are they increasing, resulting in increased funding? Are they decreasing the amount of funding going to schools? There was also um, an interesting theme that emerged particularly in parents' groups around um, concerns that there's varying agreement on what parents' rights are, what, what information they have the right to access. Um, an example being a parent being told they couldn't have access to the test by a teacher, right? So this common understanding of what is shareable, what should be transparent, what should be provided um, to help inform people's decisions um, around testing participation and it. There's still a lot of uh, room for improvement there. All right, so next let's talk a little bit more about bias and standardized testing. So in terms of bias and standardized testing, some participants expressed concern that bias persists in eliminating the validity and accuracy of results. And in particular, participants discuss perceptions of cultural bias, such that you're measuring knowledge of white culture versus knowledge of concepts and skills. Also, participants express concern that standardized testings are biased because the accommodations for students with disabilities and learning differences remain insufficient. And lastly, student, uh, participants talked about, um, of course, um, the impact um, or the perception that really what you're measuring with standardized testing is test taking ability and preparation rather than knowledge. So this next slide provides an illustrative quote from a parent regarding the impact of this issue of white and Eurocentric bias that persists or is perceived to persist. <laughs> 
Next, participants raised an idea, array of ideas and solutions and visions of a future system of, of assessments. We've grouped these into two overarching themes. So participants see a need for ex more expansive use of alternative forms of assessments. And so here, among the most popular um, alternative forms of assessments discussed are things like performance assessments, where students can demonstrate knowledge and skill. Project-based learning is one of the most popular um, alternative forms of assessments because of its um, leveraging student self-directed um, knowledge, uh, self-directed learning, and then assessments of knowledge based on that, and then also classroom-based assessments. Participants also discuss the importance of valuing and considering non-academic knowledge. So participants often discussed other dimensions of student development. So we've labeled this here as considering the whole child. So some of you may be familiar with this approach. The whole child approach thinks of children as having six areas of development, academic development, but then also mental health, physical health, cognitive development, identity development, and socio-emotional development. It also grounds the students in the social environment and emphasizes the importance of community relationships. And this was a very um, strong theme in, for parents and teachers. The importance of socio-emotional learning was a point of emphasis for participants, with parents, teachers, and researchers all mentioning the importance of this and suggesting um, somewhat that consideration in forms of assessing this should be factored in. And here is another illustrative quote from a policymaker um, on the importance of social emotional learning. And here there's a reference to the five C's some of you may be familiar with, critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration and character. So on this slide, we wanted to give a little bit more pers um, perspective by just highlighting some stakeholder specific um, findings. And here we're talking about researchers. So researchers, including psychometricians, and they provided some unique input on how to improve assessment practices. These will seem also, for those of you in that arena, will, will seem pretty uh, familiar. They discussed basically efforts to continue mitigation, mitigation efforts um, to reduce bias in assessment practices. So development of assessments that validate student experience, conducting psychometric analyses, and using expert review panels uh, to remove, remove bias. And then lastly, um, re some researchers expressed the need to remove high stakes from standardized testing, and that will be surprising to some um, and given um, changes in policy. But I think this is an important thing to note. Again, this persistence, uh, persistent uh, concern that bias and high stakes continue to remain in standardized testing, um, and in particular um, due to the problematic history so the long history of racism in standardized testing and the persistence of that um, continues to concern researchers. All right, let me pass it over to Tia to talk about accountability systems. Thank you so much, Jen. How's everyone doing? Great, glad to hear it. So next we're going to turn to reoccurring high-level topics raised by stakeholder groups that are about accountability systems. <laughs> Now, it's important for me to note that our working definition of accountability systems is the set of practices and policies that are used to hold teachers, schools, districts, and others accountable for raising student achievement. So first, I want to discuss some uh, problems that were identified by stakeholders. This includes, one, the over-reliance on assessment results. And when speaking of this, stakeholder groups also mentioned that standardized testing shouldn't be the only tool used to drive change within our schools. They mentioned standardized testing needs to be one of many metrics. Now, this was most prominent in our researchers group, but we saw this throughout our stakeholder groups. They talked about standardized testing being one of many metrics, and of course, other measures capture things like the social environment in which children learn and other school inputs to the education process. They also mentioned inadequate measures that negatively affect teachers. And we'll talk about uh, this a little bit more on the deep dive in our next slide. And resources are not directed to where they are needed most. Now, in this discussion, stakeholder groups often mentioned that schools were the lowest performance, requiring additional resources. Schools with the lowest performance, excuse me. 
often require additional resources. However, they may either not get additional resources, which includes funding, instructional support, and professional development, and often they are penalized for their accountability systems that are currently in place. And then, of course, communities are harmed by negative feedback loops. And this typically operates through two mechanisms. One, at the community level, families make housing decisions based on current accountability systems. And we also see that families with students enrolled at the school may choose to stay in their house, but send their children to other schools, such as public schools or charter schools. And this could further exacerbate color current uh, inequality within these communities. This slide represents the various themes that emerged within the umbrella of the negative impacts of inadequate measures of teacher effectiveness. These issues were raised by every stakeholder group who participated in this study. So this includes this misalignment of assessments where teachers may not be teaching exactly what is being addressed in the assessments, which either means they are learning info that isn't rewarded or not learning what is important according to the state. Teachers are often pressured to raise assessment scores and teacher and school effectiveness is based on this. We find that teachers face stress and increased anxiety for having to perform well on these assessments. And then of course, teachers cannot be creative and teach other topics or address other students' needs. They also mention that there are other things that are important for our students to learn, such as social emotional learning skills that they face pressure to drop or to focus on because they are hyper-focused on assessment topics. And teachers often face this increased pressure of leaving the profession. Now that includes this increased stress leading students to, or excuse me, teachers, to choose to leave their schools or the profession altogether. So the quote on this slide represents a teacher's sentiment of the last bullet on the previous slide in which stakeholder groups discuss the increased pressure teachers face subsequently leaving the profession. The quote touches on this mass exodus of instructors due to a hyper-focus on testing and accountability measures directed towards our instructors. Now I'm gonna discuss some potential solutions that are offered by our stakeholder groups. Participants discussed an array of ideas, views, and visions for future accountability efforts. Presented here are overarching themes that emerge and which stakeholder groups discuss them. We will discuss, we'll discuss one of them in greater detail in the next slide. So these themes included promoting equity by valuing student subgroup performance. And this is where schools and districts need to be accountable for provision of support for our students, especially students with disabilities. And this is consistent with ASA's requirements for showing performance of student subgroups such as race, ethnicity, and gender. We also wanna expand measures of school effectiveness. And I'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide expand accountability systems to have implications for school administrators. And this includes communities being held accountable for supporting our students. This includes science provisions, additional support such as housing, mental health access, physical health care. This also includes focusing on holding school boards accountable for school performance. That includes progress. And we found that policymakers believe that involvement of school boards should be an accountable measure. And then the last theme is allocating resources to those who need it. And this, in these groups talked about better coordination of services. Schools should provide non-academic supports, again, mental health, healthcare, food access to technology. The themes presented on this slide were shared by researchers and other uh, groups such as out of school out of school time uh, staff, policymakers, parents, and students. And we found that they identified alternative measures such as racial ethnic representation among school staff, diversity of curriculum or extra uh, offerings, and of course, student, parent, and or staff engagement. And finally, looking at measures such as attendance suspension, high school graduation rates, faculty retention, school leadership, faculty, and staff relationships to student and school climate. So the quote on this slide represents a policymaker sentiment on the last bullet on the previous slide in which stakeholder groups advocated for including additional measures to monitor school effectiveness. Not only do they provide suggestions for additional measures, but they also note how these changes can motivate our instructors. So due to time, we're going to transition to our Q&A. Given we've 
provided you a lot of information in this time, and it's just hard to do justice because the uh, data that we got was so robust and provided such rich discussions. I am going to provide a slide that represents a summary of the reoccurring themes that we just talked about, and you're welcome to ask me and Jen any questions that may have come up for you during this presentation. Yes. Hi, I did have a question about the, um, the student groups that you used. Yes. Were, uh, what was the age group of the student groups that were represented, and were the student groups participating with adults, or were they also separate? That's an so excellent question. It, yeah, it's interesting. So we had some student focus groups that were facilitated by students themselves. That were, those were really interesting conversations. And then we had some that were facilitated by adults and um, uh, leadership from organizations of interest. So the age were all high school students. Yes? Yeah, sure. So yes, yeah, so community engagement most often came up in terms of ideas and solutions. So increasing engagement, it was rarely discussed as necessarily as the problem itself, except when talking about accountability and really looking at school districts as an entity, right? So most of the fo conversation focused on bringing communities in as a way to help address issues. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's an amazing question. Yeah, so one of the reasons you don't see that, so the question was about the impact of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And because the question wasn't asked consistently in all groups, that's why you don't see it as a reoccurring theme. Mm -hmm. It was an extensive topic of conversation with our smaller subset of teachers. And we only really had about three focus groups of teachers, but a lot of the way teachers talked about it was in terms of innovation that emerged um, as a result of the pandemic, in terms of more flexibility and diversity and approaches and engaging students in this idea that for some students, they learned, more, seemed to learn more effectively, that they really benefited from that versus the others that were completely disengaged and lost in the process. Um, and also there was this interesting discussion was both for teachers and students in terms of like physical needs, the ability to move, the ability to take bathroom breaks, mm -hmm. right? The ability to take time, which was very interesting. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon, thank you. Hi. Um, could you say a little bit more about the context that the participants came from? So urban, suburban, a mix, uh, mix. systems with really robust accountability systems yeah. versus others. So this, is, so this is a really hard thing to answer for a variety of reasons, including technical. So in terms of variation in when recording started <laughs> and whether or not actually we got caught, the introductions mm -hmm. and where people were coming from, where they were located. So we couldn't systematically look at that. We can tell you overall, it was from across the country, um, a bit of a mix, but with much more of a focus on urban areas but it's very hard to distill some of that unless it was explicitly captured um, in the audio files and addressed. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of variation on that front. Thank you. I'm curious on the bottom two, four boxes there. So on the top one, resources are not directed to where they are most needed. Is that in terms of the school educational context? And then on the bottom box, on the solution, the allocation of resources, is that also to the schools, or is that more broadly resources to communities that are being harmed? So what are the resource allocations that are being referred to? Well, they were specifically, a lot of our stakeholder groups were talking specifically about resources not being allocated to the schools and specifically other school systems. But they do mention other harms that do impact our communities as well, where how schools perform in their schools have a larger impact on how people should decide where to live, where they choose to place their schools. I have a question over here. Uh, I know these are reoccurring themes, but uh, were there any questions asked about uh, broadband access um, for families and students? So not explicitly. There were some discussions on technology 
um, imb embedded, and that's something we can try and tease out. Um, but it wasn't a consistent and, and unified, uniform focus right, in discussion. Um, technology was raised as ways of um, alternative assessment methods, right, that can take advantage of technology, but that equitable access to the technology um, did not, was not a, was not asked consistently. Yeah. Thank you. But it did come up in the conversations in regards to how that would definitely impact student performance. Yeah. Thank you so much. Greatly appreciate the opportunity.